All right, we're going we're, we're gonna to wrap up here. What's the, uh, what's the difference between leadership and management? Is there a difference? Okay, well then if there is, then let's, let's, let's kind of go through it. What, what is leadership? Okay. How people experience themselves in your presence. Okay, I'm going to put leadership here and management here. Okay. Which do you, which do you want to start with? Let me, all right, let's start. You've been very quiet. Which one do you want to start with? Leadership. Okay. Are you a leader? I think so. Okay. Which is more important? Both are more important. That wasn't the question. <laughs> which is more important? Yeah, because you're a leader. Okay, what is leadership? Um, I think leadership is uh, being a visionary. Visionary. Yes, and inspiring others and yourself towards something. Inspiring. Okay, then what is management? Let me, let me go back to somebody else. You, you've been very quiet, woman with the red shawl. Where are you from? Okay. You're trying to keep a low profile. What is, low, what is management? If this is, do you buy that leadership is visionary and inspiring? So this is not visionary and not inspiring. Taking the direction from the leadership. Taking the direction. Making it work. Taking direction and making it work. Planning, organizing, and Making it work. What book? Yeah. All right, let's get someone from the back. You've been quiet for a while, sir. Yes, you and the red and one. Yes. You want to add to this discussion? What's the difference between leadership and management? We'll go to the back row and we'll come back to you. Yes. What well, process of managing people is what? People or tasks? Okay. So, yes, back to you, sir. Wait, he just said people's over here. Is it here or is it here? What do people think? Leadership. Okay. So I'm going to put people over here. There's some confusion here. OK. Yes, person in the yellow. System. So you're, well, we're going to take people off here. Yes. Authority. And this uses influence, OK. So the, is the CEO a leader or a manager? They should be a leader, but that's authority. Isn't the CEO a OK, so let me, just, let me just help you here. I'm sorry to be so mean, but a CEO is a title and they would have both as you started. Leadership is a characteristic. Management is a characteristic. We're not saying does someone consider themselves management or leadership. We're asking for those characteristics. So I, I didn't mean to be mean there. It's an important thing. It's, we're talking about characteristics. A CEO has leadership characteristics and management characteristics. One might predominate over the other, but we're trying to get to those characteristics. Yes, M Montreal. You haven't spoken in a while. Um, I think management is more of a more theory concept. Management is what? It's more related for, for more gear. Um, gear? Yeah. Gear like what? Gears like a clockwork. Gears. Yeah. And 
abstract concept. I don't know. Yes. Outcome focused. This strategy is over here or here? Let's go to the back row. Yes. Shared, shared goal. Yeah. Marius. Leadership is about control. Well, all right. So is it management? Are we a little confused here? All right. Does it even matter? You said it did. I'm just going to tell you, I believe it does matter. And there's a lot of stuff I just really don't care about that I think is very. But I'm going to make the point that it matters what leadership is and what management is. And Rowena and I had this discussion just the other day, and, it's, and it's, I think it's really important. What, how long have people been studying leadership? Yeah. Forever. Art of war. Why? Since the beginning of time, people have been trying to conquer other people. They've been trying to fight with each other people. How long have people been studying management? Since civilization, no, that is not correct. Schools of business have been around for 100 to 150 years. Why? That's, who said, that's correct. It's industrial revolution, time and motion studies. What management is about is about optimizing large organizations to be efficient, to reduce risk, to make them predictable systems. Well done. This is about competence, getting the job done well. Getting the job done well. Everybody got that? Yeah. Leadership is about what? Doing the right job. And its leaders require followers. Think, managing is managing something that already exists. Leadership is motivating people and generating followers to go after you to do this new thing. This is about creation. This is about optimization, right? This is about competency. This is about inspiring to go do something new. This is about change. This is about taking perturbations out of the system, right? So let's just let's keep going with this, all right? So there's a whole bunch of work at MIT by people who are much smarter than I am. And um, they've studied this. And they have this great uh, paper, which I, I don't know if I gave you, Thomas, it's called the, In Praise of the Incomplete Leader. And leadership is a process that helps us direct and mobilize people to achieve one or more goals. It is not the group of people in that formal task. So it's an ageless phenomenon that's been around forever to get people going in a direction. Management, on the other hand, has been since the Industrial Revolution. And that's about time and motion studies and optimizing, managing, managing. Think about it. So leadership is about getting a direction. We ha I have a dream. And now I'm going to convince you. And now you will follow me. And we're going to achieve this dream. That is leadership. That is leadership. That's not management. That's leadership. All right? So it's about movement. It's about passion. I'm sorry. I'm jumping over these things. Um, management is about, and you said it, you, you almost ruined the entire drama here. Because <laughs> you had read some book. Was it Deming or what was it? Or was it Drucker? Yeah. 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 Management is about things like planning and budgeting, organizing, controlling and problem solving, consistency and order and predictability. So I ask you again, which is more important? So 
do you think that there's a, so the, the fact is you need both, and if you, and if you don't have both, you're going to be in trouble. And it depends on the situation, but it's like saying which is more important, someone who scores goals or the goalie, right? You need both. Do, is there any tension between these two? Do managers love leaders? Think again. Do managers love leaders? Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Le managers love leaders. <coughs> what, what, oh, come on, let's be honest. Let's, let's stop the, the, the BS here. What do managers think of leaders? Yeah, they do strategy. They're people like the professor, right? <laughs> They're people who do strategy and come up with visions. And what's a vision without execution? A nightmare. It's a nightmare. Do we all agree on that? Yes. You know, lots of people who sit around and say, I have a vision. We'll do this. Well, damn it, get off your arse and go do something about it, right? So what... So managers have a frustration inherently. If you, don't, if, you don't, if you haven't seen this, when you think about this and you're honest in organizations, you will remember managers being frustrated with leaders. They're always trying to do something new, and the manager is like, I have not optimized the system yet. It's not predictable yet. I remember this when I was at IBM. I worked for a guy, Mike, Mike Daniels, who almost became the CEO of IBM. And we went through this whole thing, and we came up with this new thing about how we were going to implement a new opportunity-based system in the New England region. And, and then um, and it, it, would take, it was going to take two years to roll it out. And, and literally spent like a year coming up with this brilliant plan to roll it out. And then he approved it. And the next week he came in and he said, all right, now that we have that opportunity system in place, here's what I think we should do next. And I was like, what do you mean? It's not going to be in place for two years. I mean, what were you smoking last night? <laughs> I mean, this is like, what are you, what are you thinking? Your, your, your feet don't touch the ground. You're, you're up there where the rubber meets the sky. Mike, come on down. This is what's going on down here. That is not uncommon thought for managers thinking about leaders. What do leaders think of managers? Executors. What? Executors. Executors. Do they think highly of them? Let's be honest. Patagonia, what do you think? Yeah, they're unimaginative. They're drones. They don't get the vision. They're always slowing me down, as you said. Yeah. A manager is a doer and an optimizer, and their job, remember, their job is to take risk out of the system, is to create consistency, order, predictability. That's not what leaders, so there, th th let me be clear. So for those of you who are still naive, there is a real tension between these two things in an organization. There, don't underestimate that. But if you don't have them coexist, your organization will not be successful. So you as leaders need to do that. At the beginning, you're going to get a heavy dose of what? Leadership. You're creating. As you scale, you're going to need to what? Inject what into the system? Management. Management, right? And people say, people who do startups say, nah, we don't have an org chart. Well, you kidding me? You've got to have an org chart, sir. You can't have 1,000 employees and not have an org chart. No, nah, we just throw it up in the air and it just happens. You know, we're entrepreneurial. You know, yeah, you're stupid, too. <laughs> um, it, it's creationism versus consistency, order, predictability, all right? So let's just go on. You got all this. So let's just, let, let's just talk about what happens in a startup. Actually, let's, let's jump over this. There's a tension between them, and they're both important, and they must coexist. I'm going to come back to that last one. Let's talk about some people, all right? You might remember a guy named Winston Churchill. Remember him? Leader or a manager? Leader. Everyone in this room knows that guy was a leader and a terrible manager. <laughs> like he did two amazing things. And as soon as he got them done, 
he was thrown out of office. Even before the war was over, he was thrown out of office. When he converted the, the, the British Navy over to, to, from coal to, to gas, uh, to oil, he was just thrown out right afterwards. Two brilliant moves but that will go down in history, but couldn't manage his way out of a paper bag, partly because he was drunk. But let's not hold that against him. All right, let's go to two other examples right down here. That you, I don't know if you've ever heard of this guy. Have you ever heard of this guy? Yeah. Barack Hussein Obama. Heard of this person? Hillary Clinton. OK, let's start with Hillary Clinton. Leader, manager. Ma Leader? She has followers. She has followers on Twitter. Uh, that, that's not what we're talking about. What was her tagline? See. No, that was the second time when she went. So let me just go back. When, when Hillary Clinton ran against Barack Hussein Obama, this is just mind-blowing. This is one of the most amazing things of our generation. I don't, do you remember this? I remember this, but I don't know what it meant. Yeah. So you, you have to understand, Barack Hussein Obama, I don't know if you know this, is half, Afro, is, is half black, African-African. And he is, it doesn't have a father. His middle name is Hussein. And his father was a Muslim. And he is in office, he's a Senate for two years. And he, before he's even two years, he runs against Hillary Clinton, whose husband, you may, may not know, was president of the United States, <laughs> and controlled the entire machinery and had all these people who were totally loyal to him. And even to the day when Barack Obama you know, finished, 80% plus of the people who worked for Barack Hussein Obama were Clinton people. So she had everything going for her, everything going for her. They never elected a black person. And I swear to God, you know, whoever, you're from the United States, it just was inconceivable that you would elect a black person, let alone someone named Hussein, and someone who had just come in against the most powerful political machine you've ever seen. Hillary Clinton comes out, and her campaign tagline is, um, who do you want to take the call in the middle of the night? I'm ready on day one. It actually was ready on day one, but essentially was I'm ready on day one. Got that? I'm ready on day one. Who do you want to take the call in the middle of the night? What is that message sending? Management, you sure? Don't you remember all those people at the Brandenburg Gate chanting for her, you're ready on day one, you're ready on day one? That's right, that's a joke that never happened. <laughs> Competency does not motivate people. Predictability, that does not motivate people. Do you understand, have you got that? What was Barack Obama's tagline? Yes, we can. Isn't that interesting? Nobody knew Hillary Clinton's tagline, or either of them, and yet everybody here knows, yes, we can, and change, right? Did, did, did Barack Obama ever have tens of thousands of people chanting, yes, we can, at the Brandenburg Gate? What's that? No, he literally had tens of thousands of people chanting at the Brandenburg Gate. You would go to his things, and they'd say, yes, we can. Yes. We can, not I'm competent on day one. Got it? That mess, that, that distinguishing thing right there what was so powerful that Barack Hussein Obama overcame the Clinton machine. It's still, I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting uh, shakes over thinking about it now. I mean, you were in the United States, remember that? It was fucking unbelievable. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Were you in the States then? Yes, I was in college. I was 18 years old, and I remember going to rallies, and some kids that you would never think would vote were like all about it and getting involved in politics and just demonstrating 
Yes, we can. The <laughs> if he kept his mouth shut. Um, it, it, let's just simplify this. You always make things more complicated than they need to be. <laughs> this is the classic example of leadership versus management. And management is good, but it does not change things. It does not motivate people. Barack Obama did the most amazing thing of our lifetime to pull off what he did. This is the ultimate example of, of leadership versus management. Now, does this matter? Let's go back. That was very interesting. We're talking about entrepreneurship. Does it matter? First of all, there's a tension between them. They're both important. That's not the right question. The question is, when do you need them? They must coexist. How do you proceed? Here's the deal. You must recognize what the situation is. What the situation is, OK? The situation is um, the following. Uh, I am your number one programmer. I am Chris Tarr. You're at Sensible Technologies. You're doing your email. And um, I am the number one programmer. I know how to do these algorithms. I know the physics of 3D touch. You know, we've gone out of our way to recruit you. Thomas and I put this whole thing, and you're working on the core. You're working on that physics engine that we so desperately need. And you're doing your email. What, what's your name? Nimbe. Sir. Okay. Yeah, Nimbe. Okay? So I knock on the door. Nimbe, you're, you're, you're Bill. Bill, I got to talk to you. Chris, come on in. Nimbe, um, or Bill, you're the CEO. I just wanted to let you know, i got to start looking for a new job. I just don't believe that, sense, that we can get this done. It's sensible. I've been doing this for six months, and I just don't see us getting it done. So I just wanted to let you know that I'm going to start getting my resume out there. Chris Tarr gets his resume out there. He's gone in a heartbeat. Right? Is this a management problem or a, a leadership problem? It's a 100% leadership problem. Why? I don't believe. I've lost my faith. I'm, I'm, you're not leading me anymore. If he turns around and says, I've, this literally happened to me. I've been just doing my email. I turn around. And if I turn around to Chris and say, all right, Chris, look, here's, all right, let's, wait, wait, wait a second, Chris, sit down. I can do this for you. Let me look, at, let me look, let me pull the spreadsheets up here. I'm looking at the budget here. And I can probably get you, I can, bump your, I can bump your salary increase this year up to from 7.2%. I'll, I'll double it. I'll do 14.4%. Chris, are you excited? Why? That's right. What's it about? I need you to lead me. I need you to believe. So how do you respond? That is exactly the wrong way to respond. And if you do respond that way, Chris's resume is now going to be out on the street tomorrow. And he is going to be scooped up in a heartbeat. How do you respond? No, I'm gonna, I'm, I want to ask here, because you got it. How do you respond? You, 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 you get the, here's, I, we have a dream. First of all, we have a dream. And we have a team. And you can't let the team down. Like, Chris, when we got here, when we, when we started this company, we were going to fundamentally and forever change the way people interact with computers. Damn it. We sat in that room at MIT, and we said, it's time to stop making people act like computers and to make computers act like people. And I know it seems hard, but this is a long journey. No one has ever done this before. And when we do it, we're going to blow people's mind. Remember that when we went down there? Remember the look in Paul Allen's face when we showed him what we did? And he said, this will never, things will never be the same. Remember that when we went to, to the, the uh, uh, the guy who studies brains, I forget his name now, and he said this is such a breakthrough because the human brain is mostly made up of processing the sense of touch. It's not about sight and hearing. That's simple. 
Touch is the only sense that's two-way, and we are the first ones that could ever bring that out. And I don't know if it's going to happen if we don't do that. And you know, it's not easy for all of us, but we're all in this together. You, Thomas, and I, and by the way, Mike Duggan, we got, we, we're going to get this, but it's not going to be easy. We need you. You can't let, you, you, you don't say you can't let down the team, but you lay that, you lay that on them. That's the, that's the story there. And you, you say, look, that's it. And I, I, you, 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 I got to have you talk to Thomas, too, because you, you got to hear it. We all need you. We need you. You're, you're, you're laying on the vision, and you're laying on the team, and you're laying on the team needs you. Um, that's a story, all right? Next one. Can I, can I just go quickly? Because we have 17 minutes. I'm getting too far into this, and I've got to speed it up. Uh, uh, Bob Kittler walks in and says, Bill, we're running out of money. I don't see how we're going to make payroll next Friday. I think, we, I think we're good for this Friday. I don't know what we're going to make. We can do it next Friday. Management leadership problem. 100% management. I'm making this so clear. <laughs> if I say, Bob, you got to understand, we're going to fundamentally and forever change the way people interact with computers, he's going to say, he's going to leave. <laughs> right? What do we do? Say, Bob, all right. I'm clearing, I'm clearing the decks right now. Get, let's get the list of accounts receivables. Let's get the list of accounts payables. Get us our bank statements. Tell it, get the line of credit we have. Get all that stuff in here, and we're going to crank here, and we're going to grind this out, and we're going to figure out who do we stop paying so quickly? Who do we collect the money from quickly? We're now in optimization mode, right? And that's how you have to run a startup. At IBM, I didn't have to worry about this. I was in management mode all the time until they put me on a task force. It was like, oh, and I didn't realize it. Now I'm in leadership mode. I should show leadership skills. Um, but in a startup, it can happen like that, and you don't know when it's going to happen. Literally, Chris Tarr knocked on my door, and ha I had to have that conversation. And oh, by the way, if you're not good at it, your, 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 your co-founder is good, better at it, you've got to get that person in the loop as well. And, uh, and it's good when you're, you're selling leadership and stuff like that because it's not just about the numbers. When you're doing management, it's often about the numbers. There's usually an answer. When you're selling leadership, you've got to get other people involved to, to, to believe. So, um, so that's, that's why it matters. That's why it matters, all right? Um, so this is kind of like leadership is the art of getting someone else to do what you want to get done because he or she wants to do it. Uh, management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things, as we talked about. So it is, it is, it's very intense, and you got to get it right, all right? Um, and it's very easy to see. It's about change. These are the things that they studied at MIT, and they said, oh, leaders are tall. No. Leaders are small. No. Leaders are charismatic. No, because we've looked at organizations, and we've seen that people who are charismatic don't sustain results over a long period of time. So all this stuff that people talk about is not correlated and can't be causal, shown as causal to good leadership. What they came up with is leadership that produces results is not one person. It's distributed in organization. It is personal and can be developed over time. Leadership is about change. And you can grow it. And this is the model, and I'll give you the book. There has to be some capability of someone who has a vision of where you're going. That's the possible, exciting, realistic future state that you could actually get to. Sense-making says this is the as-is state, and these are the things that are happening today. Future state, current state, with changes that are going on, and then that's great, but now we have to get it done. And to get it done, you have to work with people. And then once you work with people, you have to have people, you have to have this, I, I hate this word, inventing. You have to have this GSD, we get shit done. We've never been there before, but we're going to get over to there. Square peg, round hole, give me 15 minutes and I'll get back to you how we're going to do that. This is not traditional, we've done it before, we're going to do it. This is when Erdine 
said, we're gonna, do the, we're gonna do the boot camp, Bill. How are you gonna do it? I don't know, but we're just gonna get shit done and it'll happen, right? It's plowing out there to get, to get to this future state where there's no GPS between here and there. And this is a skill of just getting shit done. When you look at this, in the first company, Thomas Massey was, or my first company, I was not good at this. I, I basically tried to do all this in my first company and I failed. In the second company, Thomas was really good at this. And I was really good at this from my training at IBM and just the nature of the way I am. And we made a really good team at Sensible on that. And then as we grew, we started adding other capability. But as you think about this, you need all this capability, not in one person, but throughout people in your organization and to understand who they are. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. So, so first of all, the great book, Founders Dilemmas by Noam Wasserman. Two founders is better than one for not just anybody. When you look at data, if you have two co-founders, the odds of success go up. Three founders, even higher than two, four than three. So building multiple co-founders, especially today, is a much better thing. Because not only are you going to get this, but you're going to get your hacker, your hustler, and your hipster. So you need this heterogeneity in the team. But that doesn't mean, you know, you just go along and the next person you find, oh, do you want to join my team? Oh, my odds just increased. You have to get the right people on your team, right? And then this is really important once you start trying to scale the business as well, right? So sometimes it's, I've never seen this to get co-founders. I've seen this as we start, as I go into companies and I look at them, if I'm on the board or something and I try to help them, this is where you might be missing. And this is a good tool to think about your companies and as you grow them. So, um, all right. So let's, let's, let's do a little case study, all right? Do we have the uh, intergalactic research case study we can hand out? Um, all right, we're not going to have time. Well, let me just, let me just give you the case study. There, there's this case study that I wrote up, if you can share it online. There's this situation, and, and, it's, and it's back in the uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, and there's this company called Intergalactic Research, and it's run by a guy named Gary Kay, and, and he is crushing it. He is absolutely crushing it. It's out on the West Coast. And I'll show you a picture of Gary in a second. And he is crushing it. All the best programmers want to work for him. He, has, he basically has software on all the computers um, in, in, in one market segment. And he, um, he, works to, he works to live. He doesn't live to work. And, but he figured out how he gets the right product. And he's got it at the right time. And he gets the best programmers, and it's work as a means to an end. And if it's a nice day, he goes out and he goes flying on his plane. And because he's made it. He's got this great company. It's producing cash flow. So what happens is this company called JCN in the case study comes in to visit to talk to him about a partnership. And it's a nice day. So he goes out flying, and he leaves JCN to talk to uh, Gary's wife at the, to you know, at the time. And, um, and JCN's a little pissed off about it and isn't too happy. But he still keeps cranking out because he has the best product. On the other hand, there's this guy, William G., whose company really doesn't have a name, and he's a bizarre guy. And, uh, but he works really hard. He's got a bunch of people who follow him around, but they don't really have a, a skill that's clear. Um, they're not nearly as good programmers. And I don't know that he tried to work at this company, but it wouldn't surprise me, and he wouldn't have taken him, because he just wasn't a good enough programmer. But he has this vision that says, I'm going to put software on every computer. And it's really not a company. It's really more of a cult, because they don't really have much money. And they, they, it's just like they're moving literally around the country at times. And I'll show you a picture of this in a second. And, um, and they don't have much of a product, really. but they're, But they're they're a, a very homogeneous, united group, really a cult. And 
it's not clear that they care about business as much. These people seem to understand cash comes in, cash goes out. You know, they, 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 they know how to do that. And, but they don't go flying and do stuff like that. They, they, if we lined them up here and put William G. there and put Gary K. there at the time, every one of you would want to work for Gary K. Probably none of you would want to work for William G. And, 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 and uh, so the, the story goes on, and, and this is actually a true story. They were both programmers. And if you asked them if they had a vision statement, they would have said, that's a bunch of MBA crap. We don't. But in fact, one did have a vision statement, and that was they were going to put software on everyone's desk. And their culture, they would have said, what? We don't have culture. But in fact, you do have culture. <laughs> it just is the way your company operates. And if you say you don't, that's a choice you make. The culture exists anyway. There's always a set of norms that exist in an organization. And, but they didn't do that, and those were all filled in. Well, you, you may have guessed, this case is the 1980s, and it was a personal computer. It was the operating system software. And uh, Gary Kay was a guy by the name of Gary Kildall, and William G. was Bill Gates. And uh, JCN was IBM, where I worked at the time. And uh, he blew off IBM twice, not once. Uh, we were so pissed off that we said, we have to do that. And they, they went to Gates and said, you, you give us an operating system. He said, I can't give it. I got nothing. He go, you got to get it from Kildall. Went back to Kildall a second time, and it was an, happened to be a nice day, changed the course of history. And he went flying again and blew off and said, meet with this person. Just tell us what you want. We'll ship you product. And uh, IBM was so pissed off, they went back to Gates and said, get us whatever you can. We're not going to deal with this guy. We need a second option. And he went across town in Seattle and got a, a, a poor, poor clone of Gary Kildall's CPM operating system and bought the rights to it, sold that to IBM, and that became the IBM DOS operating system, which later became the IBM, it became Microsoft DOS operating system because he got one term in the condition. And that was, I, I get, he would get the right to run it on other computers. And we laughed at IBM and said, huh, there will only be other computers if we allow them. Um, <laughs> that didn't work out really well. <laughs> That is Gary Kildall when he was intergalactic research. He became a cult hero and everybody loved him and here he is, surfer boy. And he was a really cool dude. And you can go on the internet and see all you want about Gary Kildall. Um, and he would do, used to do talk shows and everybody loved him. He was one of the premier programmers of his time. Uh, unfortunately, he died falling off a bar, bar stool extremely, extremely um, disappointed, to put it mildly, that uh, Bill Gates had stolen the business from IBM and IBM had screwed him. Because once he found out this had happened, he sued IBM. He tried to get, uh, said, this violates all my IP. And it did. But what IBM did is they wheeled out the lawyers and then they just forced him to settle, wrote him a big check, got him to sign a release of his rights, and he got a big check and Bill Gates went on to become the richest person in the world. <laughs> and a completely inferior programmer. Uh, this is the cult I was talking about. Does that look like a cult to you? Yeah. This person right here who's just coming down from LSD, that is Bill Gates. Do you recognize Bill Gates? Yeah. See these other people in here? That is Paul Allen right there, right? And the luckiest billionaire in the world. Um, this is a cult. You don't believe that's a cult? Think again. And by the way, doesn't mean cult is a bad thing. Your startup, if you're successful, will be a cult. You have no reason for people to believe in what you're doing. But you need to have that raison d'etre, and they need to follow you to do it. And that's what Bill Gates did. And he, he just blew, it, he blew the doors off this. So culture does matter. Even if you don't know what you're talking about, he did create a culture that you work like crazy and we're going to put software on everybody's desk. You might not like that, but that's what you did if you were at software. And you put engineering above everything else because their distribution arm was IBM. And, uh, but, you know, this is a guy that, at IBM who I didn't like. He actually destroyed the culture as far as I was concerned at IBM. And, uh, but even he acknowledges 
that my time at IBM, I came to see that culture isn't just one aspect of game. It is the game. In the end, an organization is nothing more than the collective capacity of its people to create value. That's a pretty good quote. That's a pretty good quote. <laughs> it is. Your organization is all about creating value. And culture is that thing that will tie them together to create value and to get things done. Even when you have a plan, you still can't just get people to agree to your analytic plan. You've got to get them to buy into it and follow it. How do you create culture? And I'll tell you at IBM, we're always three things. And to this day, I know them. Excellence. You do everything with excellence. Respect for the individual. You respect every individual who's here. They do a good job at work. It doesn't matter what they do outside of work. You respect them as individuals. And, if you've, and the third one was customer service. You did whatever you needed to serve the customer. Customer intimacy. I still to the day though, remember those. They're ingrained in my, I worked there for 11 years. They're ingrained in anyone who worked at IBM in that era. We used to sing about them. We were measured about them. They were reinforced at every meeting. You knew what they were. How do you do that in your companies? Well, this is common without all uh, these companies. Lotus Development, this was Mitch K. Poor and Jonathan Sachs. Apple was Steve Jobs until it wasn't Steve Jobs. They lost their way. Then Steve Jobs came back better than ever. Zipcar was Robin Chase. We can go through all these companies, and they have the, the positive aspects and the negative aspects. One laptop, one child. The Media Lab, that is Nicholas Negroponte with all his hubris, with all his vision, and his arrogance as well, and his lack of attention to detail, right? Um, all these things reflect it, the people, and they end up. So let me just, for my companies, I wrote this article. The first company, Cambridge Decision Dynamics, was three of us went out, two PhDs from MIT, and we actually had a very good product in the end. We had a million dollars. But the first day, we said, what are we going to do? We're going we're to um, have fun, do good, for the world and make money. And we literally were drinking. We went, rah, 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 that's what we're going to do. Rah, rah, one for all, all for one. Let's go. Rah. And we went and we marched out. And that was it. That was our culture. Um, it really was a terrible culture. <laughs> Not because having fun, doing good for the world, making money isn't a good thing. Those are all good things. But what's unique about that? <laughs> Does anybody in this room not want to have fun, not want to do good for the world, and not make money? It was totally like meaningless. It was just meaningless. So the next company, at Sensible, we said, Thomas and I and Rhonda got together, and we said, what are we going to be? Because this, this failed. And it didn't fail because we didn't have a good product. It didn't fail because customers didn't like our product. It didn't fail because we didn't have orders. We had all that stuff. I just couldn't get up and go to work and feel good about it. And I could not get people to do things because we just didn't have the silent supervisor that everybody was on board with the same values. Um, at at sen sen Sensible, it was an invention factory of smart people inventing and getting products to market. Probably the more important thing is this thing right here. We took the business very seriously. Very, very, but we never took ourselves too seriously. And, and that was very, very important. Is that the only way to cut? No, it's not. But that was me. That was Thomas. And if you came to our company, there was a lot of laughing going on. But anyone who ever mistook the laughing for being not, you know, not committed to the mission was sorely uh, mistaken and got a wake-up call the first time when something needed to get done and they weren't willing to stay there all night to get it done. When the mission needed to get done, you get it done. But you don't go around parading and saying the word I and me and how great you are. You laugh at yourself, you make fun of yourself in it. And this became actually, we, need, we got really smart people focused on getting stuff to market and we got people who were not only really good and focused on getting stuff to market, but they were able to commit themselves to a mission but laugh at themselves in the interim. And I'm not saying that's the only way, but that was clearly our way. And there were people that I hired who had all the right skills. 
<laughs> one who I hired for marketing. She had all the contacts. She had a good writing skills. And she walked in, and the first two days, I realized I had completely screwed up because she would use the word I and me more than anybody else. She couldn't get the jokes that were going on. She just couldn't. It was just like a blood cell came in and was just being rejected by the system. And I had to, I, had to, I, had to, I went up to Wendy and I had to say, Wendy, uh, I'm sorry, you know, you got to find a new job. <laughs> it's not your fault, it's my fault. I should never, I didn't think, I looked, I focused not on the person, not on the values, I focused on the skills. I screwed up. You're, you're very talented. I'm sure there's a better job for you. We didn't have a lot of money at that time and I said, your job now is to find a new job. If it takes you six months, do it, but please just go find a new job and I will pay you in the meantime. And that's what she did. And it was great, I didn't, we didn't have that money, but it was money that was very well spent. That's, that's when you have a culture, when you know someone doesn't fit in. Even though it seems like they do from a skills standpoint, you hire, you hire for values and you train for skills. You don't hire for skills and train for values. That was still not as good as the last one. This is Visage, and this company did well, but this one did really well. At Visage, we went from 50 million to half a billion in two and a half years. And by then, I got culture. And this is, this is, so this is Thomas Massey and myself. This is Bernard Bailey and myself. We sat down and said, what are we about? We're about contributing to our customer's success. We both worked at IBM. This is just IBM flowing out of our veins, right? You are going to be measured not what you, by what your activity reports you give to me. You're going to be measured on how successful your customer is. That's how you're going to be measured. Get people focused on customer success. You, you better get out and have pride in competing. Get on the goddamn field. Bernard was a football player. I'm a basketball player. You, the only thing worse than losing is not getting on the field and getting in the game. That is unacceptable. You get on there, you try like hell to win, and if you don't win on Tuesday, you better hurt. But you better get back up on Wednesday and get back up on that field and say, here's what I learned in that last one, and we're going to do it. This is just what we were about, and this is what the company needed. The third thing was, you're going to be measured by not what you tell your manager, but we're doing 360 evaluations by rep reputation. And the last thing is, this is a high performance, we're expecting high performance, and we're going to give authority and accountability and rewards. That means resources, authority, accountability, and rewards based not on seniority, but based on whether you get the job done. And if you get the job done, you get more resources, you get more authority, you get more rewards. We stop just giving out the increases. And this, what this did, was it made some people very uneasy because you, we put a lot more in the performance plan for, for re rewards. And the people who were below average started leaving the company. <laughs> and if they didn't, they were kind of moved out. But they realized right away the high performers were going to get the money. They were going to get it. And these things made all the difference. That's essentially the number one driver. I can give you all the strategy why we went from 50 million to half a billion in two and a half years. It was related to culture. Um, how did we do it? So it's not personal therapy. It has to do with the, what you really believe. This has to authentically come from you and the other co-founders. It's not a democracy thing. I've heard people say, oh, we vote on this. No, you don't vote on it. You're the leaders. You have to figure out what do you believe? What are the... Culture is about taking these values and making them real in everything that people do because you're not going to be in the room. When people were doing it, uh, making these decisions, we had to know that they would consider these things because we were not only that were we explicit about it, but we would measure them against how consistent they were about implementing and uh, adhering to these values. And so how do you do that? You have to figure out what you're about. You have to make it relevant to your business. It wasn't the same as you saw with Sensible and Visage because it was a different business. We were dealing with the government. They didn't want to have people that were like that. Google's it turns out, do no evil. Why is that a good one for them, for their culture? Because they, they need, you need to trust them. If you don't give them their data, their business model breaks. Yes? Yeah. What is it called? What is it now? 
Yeah. Well, <laughs> we can talk about that. This one was actually perfect for them. Well, I shouldn't say perfect. It was very, very appropriate because they needed to get you to trust them, right? Um, sorry. Um, let me just go through. You don't write 10 commandments. You, it's got to be short and very to the point. You don't say we're, we're all high integrity. Of course you're high integrity. We don't lie to each other. We, of course we don't lie to each other. What are the things that really make you unique? And I'm going to show you, that, well, I don't know if we're going to have time, but I'd like to show you the one for Jeff Bezos where he says, we obsess about customers, we invent, we think long term, it's always day one. And how this is him so totally coming from his gut and it affects all Amazon's business completely. And he just puts it out there on the video, and it becomes what the, what the employees of the company know are the guideposts on making decisions. So um, at, our, at the Trust Center now, these are what we have, and this is a little long that it's six, but everything we do has to meet the standard of excellence and rigor at MIT. That's just, you, we will not degrade the MIT brand. That is unacceptable. Everything has to be the highest quality. And if it isn't, don't ship it. That means don't get out there. And... Second thing is, we can't do everything ourselves. So everything we do, we have to look to collaborate with other people, just like what entrepreneurs need to do. By the way, we need to get diverse opinions here because we don't know all the answers, and we got to get lots of different. And that's exactly what entrepreneurs need to do. This isn't just a moral thing. This is a, that's what the Entrepreneurship Center should be doing. We should also be trying out new stuff and everything shouldn't work, so we should be experimenting. We also should never confuse ourselves as investors or taking a piece of it. We teach people how to fish. We are not in the business of catching fish. And but for that, we need to be honest brokers that everybody knows that any student can come to us and we will help them. We will not try to pry some of their company away. We won't even accept equity in them. And they know that we're beyond question. And we have to integrate with the academics and the practitioners. You know, practice and relevance here. Men's is mind, Manus is hand. Everything we do, every program, every person, every hire, every message is consistent with this. If you pick up our annual report, that's the first thing you see when you, mission values, first page, every single year. Every employee is measured against that. So this is just, you can read this article in TechCrunch, and of course we need the gratuitous uh, animation coming across, um, but I would, have you, can you send this out, Thomas? No, no. What's the other thing? I need incomplete leader. Just remind me of that. And you have to communicate them clearly. Enough. First, you have to come up with what they are, and you have to really believe in them and be able to say them without going, oh, let me go back to our values and read them off the page. Um, then you need, to make, you need to make sure that you live those. There are stories, there's examples that you make. That example I was telling you about Walmart, it wasn't just they saved money in that building. That is sending a message to everyone that we do that. At Jeff Bezos, when we went to Amazon, did anybody work at Amazon? Your first desk was a table, was a door, like, you know, on top of like horse, you know, uh, very cheaply made. And then when he was in meetings, he used to have an empty chair next to him, or he still does it probably, and that empty chair everybody knew was the customer, because the customer's view was always to be considered in it. Um, so you have to walk the talk, you have to make stories that are clear to people, the power of the narrative, and then you include it in the appraisal process. You say, do people get the job done, but also how do they adhere to company values? And then we mapped everybody at Visage, how did they do in their performance, but also how did they adhere to company values? So do they, um, do they not perform and have low adherence to company values? Some people fell in there. Not for long. Why? You get rid of them. It's easy. What's the other easy one in this? Right here. People who believe in the company values, they exhibit them very well, and they get jo the job done. Those are your stars. You love them to death. Those people, you give them stock, you pay them well. This is where you're, these are your money makers. These are your stars. These are your dogs. What do you do with these people? Which, what, let's start here. What do you do with these people? High company values, low performance. Yeah, the first thing you don't do is you don't fire them right away. You don't treat them like these people. The first thing, if somebody believes in it, is you have to look in the mirror and you have to say, 
Did I give them the right support? Are they in the right job? Did I give them appropriate training? Um, is there anything else that can be done here? Have they had enough time? Because if you treat these people like these people, everybody knows your co company values are just bullshit, right? You try to move these people up here, likely they won't get up here, but a good number of them you can get up to here. And then, boy, they, 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 like, they believe in the company, and they'll fight, they'll fight for the values. And that's, what you, that's the sign you have to be saying, sh sending. What about these people? High performance, low company values. These people, the salesperson who brings in the orders at the end of the month to, so you can make quota. They are killer salespeople. On the other hand, they badmouth the company to the customers. They don't help other people out. They might cheat on their expense reports. Um, they don't put the data into the CRM system to Salesforce. What do you do with those people? You can't fire them. How can you fire them? They, they're making quota for you. Just train them. Put a, put a fence around them and make sure they don't infect the rest of the organization. Everyone agree? Um, absolutely not. This is a cancer right here. You might not know this person, but this is Manny Ramirez, the greatest hitter of all time. Greatest hitter of all time, and the Red Sox got rid of him, and they became a better team and won the championship. These people, the person, it's not just salespeople, it's a person in manufacturing who can solve the problem but doesn't help other people. They don't do documentation. They undercut the organization. They, they criticize whenever something comes up, they're negative about it. These people are a freaking cancer, just like Manny Ramirez was. They're right inside your body and they're growing. And what are you going to do? Ignore it? Oh no, you can't ignore it. <laughs> because by the time you know, it's much worse than you ever thought. It's much worse than you ever thought. This person has to get out as soon as possible. And every, by the time you found out about it, not only is it worse, but everybody else has known about it. And they're saying, what is Bill going to do? What is he going to do? And what do you do? You have a quick chat with them. And you say, look, this is the deal. This is going to. You say, you, you're going to change? They say, yes, they are. And what do you say? OK, we got 30 days. <laughs> and I need to see concrete change. And it better be very clear. And if one peep comes out, just, we're done. Right? But you, you got to give them a chance. And then they're going to, they might even start. But it's probably, the odds are very, very high it's not going to change. But you can't just go shoot the gun too quickly. You have to, and then you have to get very active in the situation. Because remember, it's worse than you thought, and everybody else knows, and now everybody's watching you. Everybody's watching you. It's not going to work out 95% of the time. Now what do you do? You fire the person, and who takes that job? You hire, go outside and hire someone? We, no, you, you can't. Who do, what? This guy? You train them up there? Not a chance in hell. This one? Move these people over here? That, was, that might be the only one left, you think. No, you know who has to take over this job? You. You're like, no, but I'm too busy. I can't. I, I, this is the ultimate leadership challenge right now. Do you believe in your culture or not? You're going to have to suck it up, and you're going to have to get in there, and you're going to have to perform the surgery. And let me repeat, it's going to be worse than you thought, and everybody knows it. And they're watching now to see what you're going to do. And you're going to get in there, and you're going to go out, and you're going to find, holy shit, let's keep digging. we got to clear this. This tumor, it's much worse. Let's start scraping it until you get all that out, and then you got to start turning it around. And then once you start turning it around, and people see, my god, 
he is committed, she's committed, this could be, then everybody else, not everybody, but many people in the organization are going to start to help you. And when you do this, this is the ultimate leadership challenge and it's the ultimate leadership validation that you're going to have. And when you come out of this, you will have worked your ass off, you will be exhausted, but you will now be a true leader of your organization because you stood up for the values of it and you stood up to this person who was holding a gun to your head and you said, no, you're not going to do that. And remember, they thought they were irreplaceable. Remember this. The cemetery is filled with irreplaceable people. You got that? The cemetery is filled with irreplaceable people. You got to get out there. You got to make it happen. And then when you do, then you can move one of these people in there, and they're probably going to offer to step into that role. But everyone's going to watch. Are you going to pick it up? Are you going to be the El Cid who gets on the horse and rushes into battle to lead people to do that? And when you do, you will be a leader. And then, and it will, and then that will change it. You have to, you have to make your peep, you have to make your organization rank people in this way, grade them. And you force that by saying, anyone in our organization who wants to manage people, yes, you can be involved in strategy. You will be as required to do management actively. And you will be required to do people management. No more, hey, I can't write the appraisal. I can't give someone this job description because I got to go out and get a sale or I'm going on vacation. Bullshit. You are going to do that, or otherwise you will not be a manager of people. You don't say that's the job of human resources. And we're going to do it in a methodical, disciplined way, and we're going to rank people, and people are going to get compensated based on where they are. And this happens twice a year where people are in there. And that's how you hold people accountable. And then your reward system, they get a base salary, they will get variable pay for This is a bonus system. You will also give stock options to people. Stock options are wildly dis uh, misunderstood and misused. Stock options are glue to hold people to the company. Stock options mean if you stay here for four years, you will get the stock. That's glue. If you give someone a bonus, they can then leave the company. This is a bonus. This is what salespeople love to get. This is what you put people in your core, you glue them to the company with stock options. These are your future leaders. These are not the same thing. You don't substitute stock options for this. Stock options are a bathtub that, you, that, that only has a drain that goes out. There's no thing that goes in there. It starts at 100%, and then that drain lets it out, and it gets lower and lower and lower. <laughs> so you then have employee awards. So this is once a year that you do in this process where you're figuring out how do we give out bonuses to people based on performance. And then this is spot bonuses if someone does an extraordinary job, brings in a new customer, gets a product out the door. Well, then we have a pot of money that we give to people for those types of things during the year. But then we still have a big pot out here based on how our performance was. The pie is this big. And then we split it up not in a socialist, communist way, but based on performance and adherence to values, right? And then you look at your benefits that you get otherwise. That's, that's, that's how you create a culture, and that's how... Did you put this in here, Erdine? That's great. That's beautiful, Erdine. Let's do that again. Yeah, now we're talking. Uh, but <laughs> how do I tie that in? When you, when you have a great culture, it is a fabulous, fabulous experience. It's like playing on a sports team. Peter Senge talks about this in his book. If you've ever played on a great sports team, everybody trusts everybody else, and they know where they're going to be. And a great sports team like this totally beats other teams. I played on a basketball team, and we beat people who won national championships. It's unbelievable. No one on our team was that good, but we beat them because we knew, I knew what the guy on the right was going to do and the guy on the left was going to do, and I could do my job completely. And I knew when I got to where I needed to get that they were going to be there and he was going to be there, 
and, and then I could do my job extraordinarily well. And when you're on a team that doesn't function well, you're kind of looking over saying, wait, is he doing that? Wait a second, I don't know whether I'm going to do mine. And, and you, you just don't, you get overwhelmed by people who are unified. The strength of the pack is in the wolf. Strong wolf, the strength of the wolf is in the pack. You got to create these wolf packs as well for your companies. So it takes a common vision, where are we going? That's the raison d'etre, right? It takes shared values. That's what we just talked about. But shared values is not a mean everybody is the same. This is corporate culture means we're all alike. Wrong. It means we trust each other. In a good sports team, there's goalie has a different skill set than someone than Messi who scores. Messi does tiki taki. Is that right, Ardeen? He tried to get me to figure this out one time. When I was in Barcelona, I said tiki taka, and the crowd loved it. But um, you, you, people have different skills, and that's what you need, but they'd have to share the values and they have to share the vision. That is how you build a great company. That's how you get corporate culture that feeds off itself. Your initial idea, that's where you're starting this week. You're going to figure out who the customer is. You're going to figure out how do you execute against that. The whole week beyond what's going on in this is the biggest piece of the success pie. How do you build teams? You were just thrown together to do this. It's an exercise that will be very valuable for you to learn about yourself. How can you build teams? You will, in this room, hopefully find one, two other people that you might want to start a company with someday. That's fantastic. That's what you need. That's how you start. You give up on ideas, but when you find a great team, you never give up on that team. The ideas can come and go. That is culture, that is values, that is operational excellence, and we are now in overtime. Yes?